Well, let me ask you to turn to Ephesians chapter 4. We'll be spending our time in Ephesians chapter 4, from verse 1 to 6. Ephesians chapter 4, from verse 1 to 6. Sometime last year, my family and I got the opportunity to go watch an orchestra at uh, the Kenya National Theatre. Uh, what they promised was that uh, there would be Kenyan songs, Kenyan compositions that would be set to stringed instruments. And so we wanted to see that good, beautiful clash of cultures. So we went there and we found, this was our first time to, to, to attend a, an orchestra, and we realized just this, sheer scale of an orchestra. Uh, this happens to be Kenya's senior orchestra, uh, but it is small, even though it blew our minds. It's just, it's just small, relatively, uh, when you compare it with other orchestras out there. A fully-fledged symphony orchestra generally, generally has over 100 members led by a single director. It will contain a large number and variety of stringed instruments such as violins, cellos, ba- bass, violas, and harps, depending on the composition they are performing. There has been guitars and banjos and mandolins being used. I do not know some of the instruments that I'm mentioning here, by the way. <laughs> There's woodwinds and clarinets and saxophones and bassoons and oboes and flutes. And there's something called piccolos that are also played. There's a string section with trombones, or rather a brass section with trombones and trumpets and coronets, drums, cymbals, tinkling triangle, xylophone. There's always a piano or two. And it is possible to wonder when you attend an orchestra, how are all these people, several hundreds of them, supposed to give us one single piece? It is possible that that is how the Ephesian church might have felt as Paul wrote the words that we are about to read. As they looked around, they saw people of different colors and backgrounds, They saw people whose names they were still trying to learn. People with different accents and different ways of seeing things, careers, political affiliations. Paul will write to them and tell them that the church is meant to be a sort of orchestra of different people who all join together to produce one piece to the glory of God, that they are to be a diamond that when hit with light bursts forth in different colors, even though it is one unit. So look at at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 to 6 with me. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you are called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And this is the word of the Lord. Praise be to to the Lord. Amen. Paul opens with the reminder that he is a prisoner for the Lord, that he is in prison, in service for the Lord. His imprisonment is something that he is undergoing as part of the course that the Lord, his master, has appointed for his ministry. And this view of Christ's lordship over all carries throughout this whole section. Jesus has died to purchase a people and they serve his purpose of bringing all things in unity under him. So Paul is calling them and urging them to walk in a manner that is worthy of the call that they have been called. He uses the word called twice. 
What have they been called to? Like a master painter and poet, Paul has compellingly set before the Ephesians the glorious reality of what God has done for them. All the way from the opening of the letter, they have learned that they have been chosen, adopted, loved, given an inheritance. They have been with, with, bestowed with wisdom and insight. They have been redeemed and sealed. Paul further explained that they had been raised from the dead with Christ and are now sitting with Christ in the heavenly places. That is you. That is the Ephesian saints. Paul therefore calls them to walk in a manner that is worthy of this call. To walk here is simply to conduct one's life. To walk is to conduct one's life. That you want to remember that as we continue through the book of Ephesians. The great call of God does not leave any part of our existence untouched. There is no thought, no deed, no faculty or ability of the Christian that Jesus does not claim as his own. This therefore means that there is a way to live, to conduct all your affairs that matches and accords with the call that you have received. Paul will repeat this call to walk several more times in this letter. He will call them to walk in holiness in chapter 4, verse 17. He will call them to walk in love in chapter 5, verse 1. To walk in light in chapter 5, verse 7. And to walk in wisdom in chapter 5, verse 15. He will demonstrate that what Jesus has done is to affect their homes, their families, their time, their speech, and so on and so forth. But firstly, Paul wants them to know that what Christ has done, what this call has as its implication, the priority, the thing that he would urge them to not forget, the thing that he would want them to have in mind throughout, is that it has called them, God has called them to unity, to walk in unity, to be one, you see, Christ's work did not only have individual implications, but corporate too. Jesus, in uniting them to himself for all the benefits that we see in chapter 1 and 2 and 3, has also united them to each other. The church is Christ's body, and he has united within it former enemies. People who would not typically associate with one another. Former host hostiles and chiefly here is Jews and Gentiles. Uh, God has designed the church in this way so that his glory would be particularly be made manifold. The church is called to be a united group of saints that through love and service to one another displays the glory of God. So the Ephesians are called to pursue a unity. That is, this is now the outline of our summer. That was all intro, imagine. Called to pursue a unity that is firstly rooted in God, rooted in God, and guarded with eagerness. Rooted in God, guarded in eagerness. Firstly, notice that Paul calls the Ephesians to pursue a unity that is rooted in God. This is only the case because they are not the source of this unity, but rather it is founded and established in God himself. Look at verse 3 of chapter 4. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, just as you are called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. This, this unity is called the unity of the spirit. It is supplied, sustained, and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Paul then proceeds to show just how much God has given the saints in common. You see, whenever you ask people, to act in unity, the natural question that comes up is, how much do we have in common? 
That is the question that has plagued the, the that's a question that has plagued the, the, the matter of the Kenyan national unity. The question of, do we truly have enough in common to truly be a united country? And it is possible that the Ephesian church would have asked the same question. Do we really have anything in common? Baba James over here, who would have been a Gentile, an elder in the pagan temple to Diana, is wondering whether Mama Nyagodhie on this side, who has been a Jew all her life and has known one God while he has known several, could ever, ever have enough in common to actually see each other as part of a unit. You see, St. Paul goes to demonstrate that no group of people on earth can claim to have more in common than what the saints have. He says there is one body, one spirit. You're called to one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. Did you catch the seven ones? Did you catch the rhythm, the repeat of the word one? Let's look at them one by one. Briefly, we're told that Christians are one body. There is only one body. Christians are members of one body. That being the body of Christ, as we saw in chapter 2, verse 22 of Ephesians, is the reality of Christians. They are attached to one another in the way that the different parts of the human body are. There is only one body. There was only one baby in the Bethlehem manger. There was only one brow, brow sweating in the garden of Gethsemane. There was only one bleeding body on the cross. There was only one wrapped body in the tomb. There was only one reason, Christ, who ascended to heaven. And to this Christ, saints are united. And there is no other body. There is one spirit. Secondly, the Holy Spirit of God, we are all regenerated by the work of the same Holy Spirit in our hearts. The Holy Spirit empowers and fills every Christian. The same Spirit that shook the foundations in the upper room in Jerusalem and filled the disciples is the same Spirit that has worked to open the eyes of our hearts to see the glory of Christ and turn away from our sins. All Christians have this in common. Christians all have one hope. We have one shared destiny. In the same way that we look back to the same source of our salvation, so do we look forward to the same glorious return of our Lord. When he returns, he is coming for us all. The new heavens and new earth will not be subdivided according to different factions. This is interesting because when often we imagine and think of our lives in eternity, we only imagine it with people we know, right? We easily imagine friends and family being there. Oh, yeah, I'll see Jeremy over there. What if we'll be able to recognize each other and continue our friendship? Hey, but here's a fun exercise. Try and imagine the Christian that you are currently struggling to love in glory. That is what it means that we share in the same hope, we share in the same home, we share in the same citizenship. We are all heading the same way, this walk that we are called to. We are all walking in the same direction. At the end of time, we all end up in the same place around the throne of God, rejoicing forever. Christians have the same Lord, the same master to whom they swear allegiance. One Lord who died for their sins. Now scripture tells us that not all who call Jesus Lord are genuine believers in Jesus. But all genuine believers have believed in Jesus as their Lord. That means that we are all committed to pleasing and obeying the same person. Every Christian around you has one aim in life, to submit themselves to the same person that you are to submit to. Christians are called to 
one faith, that they are united in belief. Since the time of the disciples of Christ, saints have believed in a body of doctrine. As you say in our statement of faith, from the time of the apostles to today, Christians have laid out doctrines or beliefs in brief, definitive statements. As those who know God, we believe it necessary to set forth in a concise fashion the cornerstone truths of our church as guided by Scripture. Our statement of faith is our aim to coalesce and bring together a body of belief and doctrine about what we agree on so that we can all gather on Sunday saying we all believe the same things. That is why our class, when we teach the statement of faith, we usually have several sections. We usually say these are the things that Christians all across agree on. But they are things that make us Baptists. This does not mean that we do not believe that our Presbyterian brothers and Anglican sisters are, or brothers are not Christians, but this is what allows us to meet in several congregations on Sunday. But we believe the same things. We believe in the same God, Father, Spirit. A statement of faith is a summary of essential Christian beliefs that shows unity in Christ and guards the church from error. These saints have all placed their trust in the finished work of Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. This has distinguished them from those that would call themselves Christians, but are not. Uh, Christians have been have agreed and have been given universally the sign of baptism yeah, and what, what it images. Uh, for us Baptists, this sign is administered to believers only, while for our Presbyterian and Anglican brethren, it is also admitted to their children in prayer that they will one day come to trust in Jesus. Yet there is a commonality and unity in understanding that this is an outward sign of an internal reality. Paul culminates in pointing to the one God and Father that the saints acknowledge. They acknowledge him as the one who is over all, through all, and in all. God's supersedingly cosmic supremacy over all grounds their unity. God reigns over every element of creation. And so all things are united under him. And to be united is to acknowledge this and submit to it. Therefore, to tolerate and to pursue disunity is to act as if there is more than one body, more than one spirit, more than one God and Father, more than one Lord. As if Jesus could somehow be divided, as if the wall of hostility that Christ died to kill can be resurrected. As if God himself can be divided. Jesus shows this parallel when he prays for the disciples in John chapter 17. He prays that his disciples would be one as he and the Father are one. Do you notice the Trinitarian pattern in what Paul has just mentioned? In Christians joining together, they in some small way picture and point to the reality of the Trinity. It is no wonder that Jesus would call to his group of disciples, Simon the Zealot. The Zealots were those who were committed and had sworn to fight even violently the Roman Empire until they leave Palestine. And he would also have among his disciples Matthew, the tax collector. Matthew, the tax collector, worked to finance the Roman Empire through taking money from Jews. And Jesus would bring Simon, the zealot, and Matthew, the tax collector, and put his arms around them and tell them, by this they shall know that you are my disciples. If you love one another. Friends, those who have believed in Jesus have always felt different. 
They've always seemed to have apparent differences that can never be forgotten, that can never be removed. Oh, but Paul shows us here that all differences between us, all differences between Christians are superficial compared to what unites them. You see, Christians are not united necessarily by what they hate and what they are against. A philosopher called Eric Croft, I think, uh, said that when he has done a history of what has brought people together and asked himself, what truly unites people? What truly brings people together into movement and organizations? He said, hatred, above all things, has the power to bring people together. A belief in a God is not so much necessary to unite people as a belief in a devil. Oh, but Christians, we are called to be something totally different. We are united, not by what we are against and what we hate, but by who we belong to. This unity that God has given us supersedes boundaries and supersedes time and space. It unites, it unites us with believers in Christ Church, Chicago, and Zion Church in Lucknow, India, and Grace Point, Kikuyu, and Redeemer Bible Church in Karen. It unites us with Augustine and Calvin. It unites us with that plowman that we may never know who lived in Middle Age England, who believed in the Lord. And you have more in common with that person who died 600 years ago and believed in the Lord than you do with a brother or sister who has not believed in the Lord. See, looking at this congregation, I see represented different colors and socioeconomic backgrounds, education levels, gender. We live in various neighborhoods. Diverse tribes are present here. And those of you that belong to the same ethnic tribe, you also come from different clans. We have divergent views on all matter of things, including money, food, politics. We have different proclivities and attitudes, preferences, likes, and dislikes. And it is easy to ask the question, do we really have anything in common? Manuel Baptist Church, do we really have anything in common? Are we deluding ourselves in thinking that we can obey these commands to be united? The Bible answers with a vehement yes. We have way more than we could ever need to be united. We are members of the same body, are saved by the same spirit. We call on the same Father. We are looking to the same heaven. Here's a question for us. Does what we have in common, most fundamentally, i.e. God, does God form the basis of our unity? Or do we have unity? Yes, but that is based on the fecal categories of the world. Brothers and sisters, members of Emmanuel Baptist Church, what determines who you associate with and who you do not? Does the gospel determine all our uniting and dividing? Think of your friendships here at EBC. Uh, do they reflect a boundary shattering? a gospel commending diversity? Or do you have the same kind of friends that you would have anyway, even if you are not a Christian? Are most of, most or all your friendships determined by career and age, your current stage in life, your educational level? Or do they testify to the fact that you Share in the same Lord, Spirit, and Father. Here's some practical ways that you could pursue this week. 
I'm sure there are many ways in which we could foster this, but firstly, maybe you could use the membership directory to pray for someone that you do not know in this church. Someone who would never naturally occur to you to pray for. And reach out to them and ask them, hey, I'm praying for you this week. Would you text me some prayer items? Secondly, talk to people who are different from you and let the gospel shape most of the subjects that you talk about. And then do most of the listening so that you may know and understand, have enough insight and in into some people here that you've never spoken to. Uh, here's a final one. Next time you have a group over at lunch at your home, invite two people who have completely separate social circles within EBC. And allow your home to be the place where they can get to know one another and begin to form, form a friendship that they may have otherwise never developed. Be a connector. Be one who connects the person who would never talk to the other person. This unity is rooted in God, but secondly, it is guarded eagerly. It is guarded eagerly. God has given this unity to Christians, and it is to be maintained with eagerness by the individual members of the body. Look at verse 2 and 3. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. This command in verse 3, this is part of you, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, this descriptive adjective that describes Christians, acts, sort of acts as a hinge in this text. And between verse 4 and 6, what we see is what roots and grounds this unity. And then verse 2 on the other side of this hinge, we see how this unity looks like. How this unity is to be lived out. How it is protected and pursued and guarded. Such that we can be characterized as those who maintain this unity. Paul calls them to be eager to maintain. Notice that the word that is used there is not to manufacture a unity, but to maintain a unity. It is not a unity that they initiate or they create, but that they have received. It is a unity that belongs to another. Do you notice the list of the seven ones that we looked at? Do you, do you realize that they are all things that happen to us? That they are not something that, that nothing that we do ourselves? That we do not baptize ourselves? We do not create our own faith? God has himself brought himself to us and made himself our Father, our Lord, so the Spirit who dwells in us. We are passive receivers of the things that unite us. And so they are to maintain. It is God who gives unity. When today we get to vote in hopefully nine people, into the membership of Emmanuel Baptist Church. There's a picture that is sort of enacted there, the same that we have at a wedding. There's a point in a wedding where there's the, the person officiating usually says, who gives this woman to this man? And in that moment as well, when we were voting in members, we say, there's a question, who gives this man or this woman to this church? And the Lord says, it is I. And who gives this church to this man or woman? It is I. It is God who arranges and brings together and creates and gives unity to his people. His people are not told to look to themselves and try to think of ways to create a unity to, as if they could have the ingredients. No. They're told, you have walked into a unity that's created, that is blood-bought, 
maintain it. And maintain it eagerly. That there is to be an energy, an anticipation, an excitement that our feet are to be swift in creating unity and slow in creating disunity and discord. We're told to do this in the bond of peace. This word bond is the same as the word ligament. And clearly Paul has the picture of a body, a human body in mind. I googled yesterday, how many ligaments does a human body have? Don't know why you needed to know it was yesterday, but there we go. And it is nine, more than 900 ligaments. The human body has ligaments everywhere. And in the same way that Paul says, in the bond of peace, the ligament of peace is that in as much as we have ligaments all over the human body, so are we to have peace in all parts of this body. Eagerly maintaining the unity of the spirit, the bond of peace. Christian, does this describe you? Member of Emmanuel Baptist Church, do you eagerly pray for and desire and seek the unity of the saints? Whenever a saint raises a reservation about another saint, Do they meet you with an extinguisher to put out the fire of discord? Or do they find you with fuel? Are you the kind of person where gossip goes to die? Or to be fanned into a bigger flame? Christian, are you more inclined to believe good news about fellow saints? or more inclined to believe bad news and bad things about your brothers and sisters that Christ has died for? Is there an excitement, energy, anticipation? When you are pursuing unity, or is there a lethargy? an absent-mindedness, a lack of intentionality, a lack of prayer and desire for this unity that is bought by the blood of Christ. Here's something for you to pray this week. Members of Emmanuel Baptist Church, pray that the Lord would give us the grace to eagerly maintain the unity of the Spirit. Pray that the Lord would make us peacemakers. That we would be the ones that are encouraging gently a saint who has a reservation against another one to rush to their brother and tell them of the wrong that they have done. Paul then proceeds to give the ingredients of this guarding and this maintaining Uh, He mentions humility and gentleness with patience, bearing with one another in love. Uh, Let's look at them one by one. Firstly, humility. Uh, Humility is the opposite of adopting an exalted view of oneself. It is, in my opinion, it seems the key ingredient in the maintaining of the unity that is called upon. To be humble is not so much to lower one's view of themselves as it is to align your view of yourself to how God views you. As someone said, who knows himself best views himself least. It is this humility that will allow us to live in unity. As we don't form ourselves into factions through pride and self-regard, To be humble would be to see ourselves chiefly as sinners saved by the merit of a savior and therefore would not, we would see the commonality that we have with fellow saints. This 
low-mindedness. As Matthew Henry put it, the more lowly-mindedness, the more like-mindedness. Secondly, uh, gentleness. Uh, this means a wariness, a fear even, of doing or saying anything that would cause injury to other brothers and sisters in the church. It is the opposite of roughness. It is instead a grace that laces our words and marks our deeds. It is marked with a forethought before we say or do. It is seeking to bear with the scruples and foibles of others. Uh, patience. This means a long suffering with one another. Uh, this assumes that you will see the weaknesses in other saints and that their weaknesses will not likely dissipate anytime soon. You know how sometimes you've seen someone do something that you don't like and they're like, maybe just, yeah, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure they've seen it, right? And then they do it again. And like, yeah, I, 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 yeah, it's so clear to me. Uh, they, yeah, they, I'm sure they've seen it, and it's yeah, it's probably gonna be dealt with. And they do a third a third time, and you're yeah, I think I think I need to say it. Uh, and you say it, and you're like, oh, it's sorted now. Now it is done. Oh, what if they do it again? Now you feel okay. Now now you're clearly making this person. Now you're clearly doing this in order to make me angry. Right? This is not just you doing something. This is you directing this action towards me. I can even see you looking at me while doing the thing. <laughs> Paul calls Ephesians to a long suffering. Suffer for long because of the actions of another. Finally, bearing with one another. <laughs> I like the way that this just assumes that there will be difficult people in the church. That there are people that you will find difficult. There are people that you will be, you feel awkward with. There are people that you will feel that the, the, the grease of the, to turn the relational wheels just isn't there. Paul says, bear with one another, but notice what he says? With love. Right? We live in a culture that says, okay, yeah, just don't hurt people, just leave them, but carve out your own space where you do not have to interact with that person. Right? We, we usually say, just to, in order to maintain my peace, you know, in order to keep, just, I, I don't need negative energy, just <laughs> cut out toxic people in your life. The idea there is, yeah, I'm not going to do this person any harm, but I'm just going to cut off my life from them so that we do not overlap. As that Swahili phrase, sisi nikawa majina mafuta, sisi. Atupatani. No, this is a bearing with one another in love, a bearing with one another that draws towards one another. A commitment to say, hey, I see that, I think that that is something that hopefully the Lord is working on, but I am here with you, and I am here for you. I am eternally attached to you, for we are members of one body. But notice they're bearing with one another. As I've been saying this, maybe what's coming to your mind is you bearing with other people. Have you considered the possibility? that others just might need to bear with you. Now, that's a humbling thought. Friends, does this characterize our lives? Have we seen a progress in this, in the recent past? Has it occurred to you that that disagreement you're having with a fellow saint. Has it occurred to you that you might be wrong? Or that you need to humble yourself and admit your wrong? Or even if they are wrong, has it occurred to you that there is a gentle way to go about that? Have you 
have you quickly snapped without patience? Have you written off this church because of a wrong that occurred to you? Friends, if that ever happens, and you feel that you need to give up on this church and go to another church, you will still need humility, gentleness, patience, and to bear with other people. You know why? Because you will be there. (laughs) And we are all sinners. Friends, who would you need to talk to this week as a way of obeying this pattern? Who would you need to mention in your prayers tomorrow morning as a way of living with bearing with others? Which name comes to mind when the word patience or humility or gentleness come up? May the Lord grant us this grace. This unity has to be grounded in what Jesus has done for us. It cannot be based upon African politeness. It cannot be carried around with with, with lack of of overt conflict, but many passive-aggressive comments. It is to be pursued, maintained, and it can only be so if it is grounded and built upon and founded on what Jesus has done. You see, at the beginning of every orchestra, there will be one note that is played by all the instruments. Uh, That is usually A or B flat. That is to make sure that all instruments are tuned the same way. But in order to do that, the director doesn't tell everyone, play the A note on your instrument. For even though they will be playing A, they would actually all clash. What instead happens is the oboe, or the oboist, that's an instrument instrument called oboe, is told to sound the note A. And then everyone is told, everyone is supposed to tune their instrument, the A on their instrument, to that A. And so it is with the local church. We're not all called to sound our individuality, but we are to first be immersed in Christ. First all sound the same note. It is only in that way that we can be united to play one piece that glorifies God. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we beg and plead with you that you would grant us the grace to walk in a manner that is worthy of our calling. That you who have reconciled former hostiles has now called them to live with one another in a way that peculiarly shows your glory. Oh God, would you allow that that would happen in this very congregation? Would you allow that that would happen in the church universal? We ask, oh God, that you would work these graces in our hearts. Burden our hearts, oh God with an eagerness and our desire, an energy and effort that is aimed towards maintaining this precious unity that you have brought us into. Pray this in Christ's name. God bless you.